I've featured remote control light switches before, but I thought, let's revisit them because they are evolving. The little receivers are getting more clever. And also the style of some of them, it's going away from ordinary light switches. It's going into these sort of more stylish sort of multi-button formats. So the idea of these is that if you're maybe modifying your house and you decide that you, you've got a single light switch for a light in a room, but you decide you want other switches around that same room, what you can do is you can remove the light switch and you can use existing back box to uh, mount a new switch like this that uh, will can give remote control over the light. And when you do that, all you do is you use a bit of terminal at the back to actually bridge the switch out. You then add a little device like this in the vicinity of the light and the ceiling. It could be actually built into the light or you could put it in a back box behind it. And then you can actually pair it with, well, this switch, or it could be a little switch on the wall that's a really stylish, just a small one like this, or that could be mounted on your armchair even, or you could use a, a key fob remote control as well, which would give control of the light and just let you turn it on and off from all these locations. If you were wanting to control more than one light, you could assign it to, say, one of these buttons. This doesn't have a battery in it. This is why it's not doing anything. But you could have this one controlling a wall light. You could have this one controlling a feature light. It just means that you can add more lighting without loads of wiring being run anywhere. It's pretty good. It's an interesting system. Uh, especially because these little receivers are getting quite clever. But this video is strictly about these switches here. I shall shove that to the side. So these uh, switches, if I open this up, note that it comes with these double-sided pads, but they're just pressed into the back. They, they haven't been peeled yet, so they're just sort of parked in there, which actually works quite well. But uh, if you want to stick them to a wall, aside from the fact, remember, it's going to be quite destructive when you do so. So make sure you get the, a spirit level on it and you get the height you want before actually sticking it on. Uh, remember, you'll have to actually peel the back of these and stick it in there first before actually putting it in the front. But if you pop them open, like this, I could use a spudger for this, but I shall just prise it open like that. It reveals the inside, which is designed to accommodate. I like the way these just hinge open like this. That other one, well, I'll open that other one as well. And you can see. It just hinges up the way. And I notice uh, these are actually done in a few different styles. Now, the, these came from eBay, and you can buy the switches and the receiver on their own, uh, but they're all very standard now. They're using a standard chip, as you'll see when we actually reverse engineer. So the listing in here says 433 megahertz, 350 megahertz. You get to choose the, way, the frequency it transmits on. You have to get the receiver and the transmitters to match, otherwise they're not going to operate each other. And also, depending where you are in the world, you're going to have to actually choose a suitable frequency for where you're located. But uh, it says 433 MHz, 350 MHz, RF remote control switch, 86, not sure what that is, wall panel transmitter, 1234 button. Uh, this one came from Fighting 21 that's like Fighting 21 without the T. Um, and it costs £5.30, that's inclusive of all the usual taxes and things that are applied these days. And it comes in these uh, different styles, it comes in the single button, a double button with that sort of like... Uh, stylish i'm trying to remember what, what that symbol is i can't remember it's a sort of like the the good and evil sort of thing yeah there's a name for that i can't remember but they also do this three-way version and also the four-way version i've got here and I, rather than just buy one of each i just bought the single one and the four-way one because i reckon that they'll probably all use a similar configuration inside in the case of this one it's using just a single button in the middle uh, note by the way i ran out of batteries it takes a 27A or A27 style battery, the little 12 volt remote control battery. In this case, I had to improvise. I had to make a stack of cells into one of the bit of heat shrink just to uh, get this operating. Um, but note that the circuit board is the same. It's got the position for one, two, three, four buttons at the corners for these ones. It's got a middle button. And in the case of the... Uh, two-way switch i'm guessing it's just going to operate probably just one of these buttons on either side and probably hinge from the top but for the three-way i reckon that they may 
uh, probably hinge from the top but have a middle button here and then one button at either side to actually operate. And it's quite interesting, I've already had a wee poke at the circuitry here and they've left their options open here. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take a picture of these uh, and we can reverse engineer it and see what the circuitry is like. And this time, instead of just going, there's the RF block, I'm actually going to reverse engineer the RF circuitry as well so um, we can see everything that's in the circuit board. So one moment, please. OK, let's explore. So it's a standard circuit board, but it has an interesting feature. Please excuse this random hair down here. I didn't spot that when I was taking the picture. It is based on a very common EV1527 chip. Now, these chips have uh, internal memory for a code that is, I think it must be programmed at the factory, but it gives something like a million options. It's like it's a really high number of bits. Is it 20 bit? I'm not really sure. It's quite a large number. But then additional to that are four inputs and whatever inputs are active, and you can use a diode matrix, I believe, in these to increase the number of buttons above four. But uh, whichever ones are active, that's the code that gets sent to the receiving device. So in this case, they've got the four inputs, they've simply attached one button to each of those inputs. But the middle button, which is an optional thing, uh, they've put these pads, linkable pads in. So whichever arrangement they've got, supposing they wanted to do three diagonal buttons, you know, it just leaves their options open. They could have this button active, this button active, and then this button here could actually be configured to go to one of the inputs that they had an unoccupied button position. But this circuitry is very simple. Um, and it is following the manufacturer's uh, sort of data sheet notes, which is interesting regarding how it turns it on using a PNP transistor. I'll cover that in the schematic. Then this is switching the RF circuitry and uh, maybe the RF specialists will know. This transistor is just called an RF at the top and then 84. I see this in a lot of these devices, but it's an RF transistor and it's got a, what they call a saw, a um, surface acoustic wave resonator, I believe here, which locks it to that frequency and then the components around are just sort of designed to support that. And all this does is it gates this on and off and that transmits the code. If you look at the single button version, we can see they've just left the other button positions unpopulated, but they have put that little link in so that it connects it to whichever pin they chose. And it could be any of these pins, so you could theoretically uh, have uh, a whole load of these buttons. Well, it doesn't really matter, it's its own code, so it doesn't really matter. But you, they, it just lets them choose which one of these inputs that it does actually code onto. And it's the same RF circuitry. If we look at the back, it has the antenna as the main feature. For those of you wishing to have a go at reverse engineering, I don't totally uh, recommend it because a lot of the circuitry is hidden under here. But uh, here is the antenna going out through a pad via a, uh, either a capacitor and inductor, I think it's capacitor, uh, and a resistor. And then it goes through, goes through in this really big pad. And uh, it goes on to the antenna, which has this solder pad option. I'm guessing that given that uh, the lower frequency is at 315 megahertz will have a um, longer wavelength, they've probably got that pad can be soldered in to increase the length of the antenna for optimal length. Um, and also they've got a pad here that theoretically allows them to extend it further if they want to increase the range. But it's a very straightforward circuit. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic. So here is the schematic. I shall zoom up even closer on this. It breaks into two sections. I've put the dotted line here to separate the two of them. We've got the bit that actually generates the code and we've got the bit that actually transmits the signal. So once again, they've got this interesting arrangement whereby they've got a PNP transistor that is normally pulled off. Uh, pulling it off, yes, that's nice. It, it's normally pulled to the off state by this 27K resistor. With a PNP transistor, to keep it off, you pull its base towards the positive rail with an NPN transistor, as in this one. To keep it off, you'd pull its base to the negative rail. So um, it's got that 27K resistor to keep it off, but when you press a button, current flows into the, uh, the remote control chip 
uh, there's a limiting resistor here, but it actually effectively pulls the base of that down towards the negative rail, which turns it on, and that actually turns this chip on. It also turns this LED on at the same time that has its own resistor. Uh, the chip has very little in the way of support components. It's got a filter capacitor just for general smoothing of the supply. And it's got a resistor that sets an internal oscillator that determines the speed at which the data will be transmitted, pulsed on and off. But that's all that's doing is it's effectively gating the uh, oscillator. Although in some instances, this resistor could be chosen to actually put the data out. I'm not sure if it can be used to actually just transmit the data directly. I'm not sure if it can actually modulate itself. I think it is just purely the speed at which it will relay the data out to the actual uh, the device that's transmitting it. But the output of this comes down, it goes to this transistor, and this transistor here basically turns this whole block on and off. Now, uh, what was that uh, transistor called? It's an L6. L6. So when this transistor turns on and off, the circuitry looks like this. It has an inductor feeding the sort of what you might call the supply rail of the resonance circuitry. We have the RF transistor with an inductor in series, and it is biased on very gently by this 27K resistor just to hold it in a sort of semiconducting state. Um, there is a capacitor for, I guess, stability across the input to the output, unless it's forming a resonant circuit, which it may well be doing. This capacitor here is quite important between the emitter and the collector. This is something where the RF guys will know a lot more about this than, than I do. But when I used to make little microtransmitters, there was a capacitor across that, which turned it into a particular type of oscillator. But here's the interesting bit. Here is the saw, the surface acoustic wave resonator. And correct me if I'm wrong with that. I think that's what it is. But that's uh, this interesting component here. R433, that's the frequency it's tuned to. Now, because uh, they've got a small piece of this crystal in here, because the, the speed at which the signal can propagate across it is much faster than the actual, the sort of like the, the wavelength of electricity as such for the transmitted wave, it can be much smaller. It can be a tiny fraction of the actual wavelength they want to transmit. But it is basically based on that sort of wavelength frequency, but actually tuned down. Usually just fine tune it with lasers to cut, but what it, it's pretty much a piece of piezoelectric crystal, I believe, but it's resonant, very accurately resonant at a specific frequency. This third connection, I think, is for uh, the load capacitors they use in such things. This will be gibberish to MD is not into RF technology. But the idea is that the other components will be chosen to get a rough operating frequency of round about 433 megahertz, but then this will actually lock it into that very specific frequency. And then it couples via either, I think this is a capacitor. I think it is a capacitor because uh, other components that were shown as capacitors, yes, yeah, similar, but these ones are inductors. They look the same, it's very, and they're not marked. Capacitors and inductors are a bit of a nightmare in surface mount stuff. But it's coupled onto the antenna and then that transmits that sort of that wave through the air to the actual devices that are receiving it. And that's more or less it. Um, it took a while to reverse engineer, partly because uh, not this. I'm not overly familiar with uh, this particular use of this uh, component here, so I had to basically probe a note on the schematic, on the picture itself, uh, what was connected where. But I correlated it to some of the manufacturer's guidance, and it was pretty much spot on with that. The only odd bit being that extra resistor in the series between the actual uh, circuitry and the antenna. It might be for stability purposes. But this is a very standard chip. It's found in everything, which means that's good because it means that, you know, things like this are completely compatible and things that a little uh, remote key fob will also use the same chip. And it means that those receivers, uh, you get a wide range of the receivers in 12 volt as well as 120 and 240 volt. Uh, probably in 5 volt as well. But they can all uh, be compatible with that. And you can use the one key fob or button to operate several receivers as well, as well as uh, programming several buttons, well, up to 32 in many instances, into one uh, receiver, which just gives maximum versatility. It's an interesting system. But uh, those switches 
are very neat. I particularly like the way that this one's flaps fold open. They fold open and then the circuit board just literally lifts out complete from that. It's very modular. It means if you ever had one go completely wrong, you could if you had a matching one. You don't need to unglue this in the wall. You could actually take it off. And likewise, if one of the buttons get damaged or, or stained, you can just unclip these and then you can clip a new button in if you get the same uh, switch. It's very versatile. It's very neat. Yeah, that's quite stylish. But there we go. That's these remote control switches. And in a future video, I'll take a closer look at the receiver and actually show how to program the receiver because they can do uh, various things. You could program it so that when you push the button, it's only active as long as you push the button. Or you can toggle it on and off. Or you can have two buttons on and off. Or you can actually have it so you can set a time. So when you press the button, the light or whatever load it was would light for a certain length of time and then it go out later on. But the instructions are in Chinglish. So I really need to make that video because... Uh, that's the only way you're going to learn how to program those uh, those uh, receivers because, um, yes, the, the instructions don't make it particularly clear. It took a lot of experimentation. But there we go. That's those switches. I like them. Very neat.